Hello guys, Deuteran slash Lawrence Wayne here, and welcome to the Commando 32 How It Works series. In this video series, I will be showing you how the Commando 32 works and its compiler. Because the Commando 32 is a special case, I've done How It Works videos for all my Redstone computers so far, because it's often requested. But the Commando 32 is a bit of a special case because it has a compiler, and more people have actually requested how the compiler works rather than how the computer works. Don't worry, I will cover how the computer works, but uh, I'm gonna go over the compiler first. Uh, this may be a multi-part series, because there's gonna be a lot to talk about. I know it's at least two parts, one for the compiler, one for the computer, but I may split it into even more parts, because it's gonna be long. If you only wanna know how just one thing works, like if you wanna know how the computer works, or if you only wanna know how the uploader part of the compiler works, there'll be links in the description, so uh, check for that. Anyways, let's get started. What does the compiler program do, and what makes it so special? Well, um, I accidentally double-clicked that button, and now we are running two. So I'm just going to close that one. Uh, this is the Commando 32 program. It's this little window in which you select a program, and you can upload it to uh, a Minecraft computer. So, if you've got a little program like this one, you drag and drop it in. Uh, don't worry how that works, you can also choose a file with the file open menu and you'd click here and it would upload. Now because I don't have the Commando 32 open so I don't have as much lag when recording, I'm just going to do verify syntax which does almost the same except it skips the upload step. And As you can see it outputs all this garbagey stuff in uh, standard output, that's all my debugging information because I don't really use the debugger that much. Uh, I do use it but I usually just use this kind of system so I can see what's going on, seeing if it's missing a step, because lots of the steps are repeated, so the debugger wouldn't be very useful for that. Anyways, let's find out how this works, step by step. We need to take this, which is the program by the way, this is the simple program that we just verified, and we need to somehow get this to the Commando32 and have it understand what it means. We need to turn these into Commando32 instructions and get it onto it. That's basically the job of this program. Take this and somehow put it in to Minecraft and make it work. Make it do exactly as you describe here in the syntax that I've already defined. So this is a Commando 32 program. Uh, it's pretty simple, it's pretty high level. It basically means it's easy for humans to understand, not so much for computers. Uh, it's going to take a while, it's going to take a lot of processes, to get this to a level where the computer will understand. And that's basically the job of this thing. So, we've got a lot of things to do. We need to make this into instructions, into Commando 32 instructions. We need to um, then convert those instructions into a format the Commando 32 will read, uh, which basically the Commando 32 works with scoreboards, by the way. Uh, all instructions are stored in special scoreboards with special players with weird names like player1, player2, player3. Those are all the usernames of the fake players that it uses to store the instructions onto. And their scores are basically what the instruction means. So different numbers would mean different things. We're going to go over that a little later. But right now we need to understand what the user is trying to say. That will be the first step. Also we need to get it onto the computer somehow, which is the uploader step. So let's get started. Um, right now, this is the state of our code, actually. It looks a little like this. It's not very colorful. In actuality, Notepad++ just makes it look pretty for human convenience. And this thing also isn't there. This is just, again, to make things look fancy. So we have it in a hex editor. This is what it actually looks like to a computer. Well, not really, because, again, this is a bit more convenient for humans. It's hexadecimal. Computers didn't see hexadecimal. But the point is... This is what the file looks like. As you can see, well, you can actually identify the words and stuff here, but what this text file really is, and what most text files really are, is they're just a series of letters. It's this letter V, letter A, letter R, letter P, ATO. Then there's a special letter over here, which means new line, backslash N. Uh, it's a special letter, but it's a letter in the computer's sense. Digits are also considered letters, and so is the equal sign. These are all, they're all just letters. Um, now when we look at it as a human, 
we see the word function, we see uh, a math operator here. You know, we see some text, we see code blocks and stuff. The computer doesn't see that at the moment. Right now, it just sees code. Uh, well, it sees letters rather, individual letters, which are completely meaningless. It can't see that this is a function. It just sees that they're a series of meaningless letters right now. So what we need to do is we need to separate this by the words and the features it has so we can understand what it means or so that the computer can understand what it means. And that's the first step to the compiler. So when you click this little go button, we're going to go into the code. By the way, this is all written in Java. So if you don't understand Java, sorry, uh, I'll try to explain what it does. This is some commented out code. Ignore that. My coding strategy is pretty bad. So let's assume you clicked upload. Um, this is a big switch statement that decides what to do. Um, then it chooses what type of file you have. We chose a high level because that's the default one. And it runs the compile method, which goes over here. And this basically throws some exceptions in case it's uh, something went wrong, an error occurred during optimization, during compiling. And it would tell you if there's an if it's successful and whatnot. And uh, basically, this is the thing that does all the f all the work. So I'm using control click here to go to the method that it's calling. So that goes into the compiler clause, which then takes the code, store it in there. It sends it to a token set, which stores tokens, which we're going to explain just now. And this is a convenience constructor, which uh, basically calls the token reader, which generates tokens from text. And Finally, after going into like four different classes, we get to the token reader class. This is where our first bit of magic happens, the first stage to understanding this meaning, the currently meaningless letters. So what the tokenizer does, as it is called, is it converts this um, meaningless letters into little sections called tokens, and it identifies what they are or it attempts to identify what they are. Sometimes it doesn't know what they are yet, and it will find them out later. Like right now, it may not know what var potato is, but once the parser goes past, it'll see it's declared as a variable, so it'll go find any var potato tokens, and it will replace them with the type variable. Uh, you'll see that later. So right now, for example, this would be var capital P O T A T O equivalent to three, four, two, semicolon, new line, tab, C A B B. That's all meaningless. It doesn't see that this is an operation. It just sees it as meaningless letters. I think I've said that enough times that now. But yeah. So basically, what this thing does goes through every letter, and every time it sees something interesting, it goes, "Okay, that's I think is where the token ends. We're gonna take what we have found so far, and we're gonna store it. I'm gonna see what it is. So we go, la 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 la. New line character. That's something special." What do we have so far? We have this bit of text. We're going to identify this as unknown because we don't know what it is. Um, you'll probably see that somewhere here. We've got get next token. Uh, basically, a big loop that goes through all the text. And uh, here are all the separators. These are called uh, single, to single character tokens. We only have a uh, single character token instant identification. We don't have double character tokens like double equals and larger than or equal to which means we don't have those in the language unfortunately I would have actually liked to add those but because of how I wrote this system I can't add it anymore it also makes it a bit difficult to parse comments and stuff but I'll get to that later so basically if we find anything interesting or we find new lines or I'm not going to go through this step by step uh, this is multi word stuff we'll work on that later Where's the new line? I think we ignore new lines at the moment, but... Anything like space or uh, white space, there it is. New line, tabs, spaces, those are considered white space tokens. And therefore, everything before that is become... It gets checked as a token, and this is uh, unknown, because we don't know what it is. And then it'll continue going, it'll read this, see a new line. This is unknown, it'll go over here, see a space. There's a, some sort of separator here, and it will take this, and basically it will try, see if it recognizes any of them. It does, it's a function. So this is a token.function. 
Now, as you can see, I actually have multiple types of func functions. You can actually declare func, void. They will all do the same thing, despite me always using function in my code. But it actually supports all of these different types. They all do the same thing. Um, so yeah, and it identifies them, and it adds a new token. Each individual token, by the way, stores some parameters. They store text, their type, which by default is end of file, because that basically means it's a rubbish token, and line, which is an interesting one, because when something goes wrong during compilation, it actually reads the tokens, see what they mean, and if it sees a token that it doesn't understand, it'll go, I expected a semicolon token here, or I expected a var type token. I should have used an enum for this, I'm sorry. I didn't know what enums were yet. I used all sorts of bad stuff, but I, I learned a lot about programming just making this, so it was fun. And uh, attributes, which are basically flags and stuff, and there's some debug stuff that I stored in there, I think. I'm not sure. Anyway, uh, there's some functions and stuff. <laughs> it's useless, uh, basically, if it's a comment or whitespace. I use that for other stuff. Uh, later in compilation. So, that basically goes through all the code. It sees this is an equal symbol, this then is unknown because we don't know its variable yet. This equal symbol is also stored as a var op or something. It sees these digits, it sees semicolon, it goes and it notices that all these tokens between this special token and this special token were integer digits and it'll go well, this isn't a word, it's a number, so it stores it as a token, as with everything, but the type it gives it is number. And, uh, yeah, it continues going for everything in the code. And once we have that, we have a big table of tokens. And uh, I actually have a little, basically what it looks like over here. So the code separated by tokens on each line, you can see for like comments this is all becomes a single token because it sees this double slash well actually it doesn't it sees it as this because it sees this slash and it sees ah that's a special token divide symbol and it'll immediately jump to a conclusion at that token and uh, it'll send see another slash and then go wait a second the last thing we saw was a slash as well so therefore this must be a comment oops and then it reads everything until it sees a new line as a common token. That's basically a flaw because I only check one character ahead every time with my parser, or tokenizer rather. The parser comes later. Uh, so that's a design flaw. But uh, there's a lot of dev design flaws in the in token processor, so I have this little thing called the token post processor, which is in the compiler class for some reason. Don't question my bad coding strategies. And in here we do some stuff. See, we remove the slash before and after comments, because also multi-line comments have that slash at the end, which confuses the system a bit. Um, also, we keep track of the token line numbers here, and then we remove the white space tokens, which is tokens like space, uh, I didn't actually write them here, but tabs, new lines, all that stuff, it's useless. We need to throw it out. And uh, this over here is a bit of interesting code as well for the token post processor. It, uh, Again, the compiler jumps to conclusions and goes equals. It says, ah, this is a set operation or compare operation. Then it sees minus. Ah, that's a math operation, like subtraction. Then it sees five. That's a number. But it doesn't see that this is negative five and not minus five. There is actually a difference. And it is annoying to tell that difference. If you've ever like seen a calculator, like a scientific calculator, you'd often see that there's a two minus symbols is a negative symbol for negative numbers and a minus symbol for subtracting. The reason that is is because it's actually pretty difficult to tell the difference. So uh, that's what that bit of code does. It uh, tries to, and it adds the attribute negative to uh, the token. And as you can see, this is basically the code that throws out the old token, the negative, the subtract token, and replaces the number token with a negative number token. All right, so we have this bit of code in token form. It's referred to a lot in the debug output. Uh, not here. 
but pretty much all over the place it'll refer to tokens these are the individual tokens it's reading and uh, stuff I may be going a bit slow through this explanation anyways once we have done that and we have converted everything to tokens we can read these tokens and interpret what it means so now we need to know all the individual words which is kind of how humans read it we can find out what those words are trying to say and what they're trying to declare uh, this goes towards the language specification uh, now when an actual compiler what an actual compiler will do is it goes through the code and it basically does a um, grammatical check rather that's how I would best put it basically see if your code is valid um, it doesn't actually see what the tokens are it just sees what type they are so if it sees variable uh, set operation number semicolon it doesn't care what the variable is it doesn't care what the number is it doesn't care how you wrote the semicolon how many spaces you put it just cares the types and that'll basically go okay that's valid in our grammar if you said variable um, compare operation like larger than smaller than equal to which is double equals in most languages for that reason by the way so that the language parser can see if it's valid and then a number it'll go you can't compare numbers so this is invalid and it will throw an error uh, that's pretty much your how compilers error actually work in a real compiler not in my compiler but uh, in real compilers I'm gonna explain that anyways because it's a pretty interesting fact and uh, yeah it does this before it actually starts compiling now this is very useful because because the compiling process is pretty slow you can find out your error right away if you ever notice that when you compile a program sometimes you click it and the very next millisecond it'll th tell you there's an error at line 5 you did this wrong or it will try to tell you what you did wrong it often doesn't work but sometimes it's right and uh... yeah this is actually very convenient my compiler does not do that and i realized why they do that much later because if you can see we have all sorts of errors all over the place we have an error thrown here we got an error thrown here we got an error thrown here we have an error thrown here we've got errors thrown here we've got errors thrown here we've got errors thrown here this errors all over the place error checking everywhere because there are so many mistakes a user can make and a code is just all over the place all this error checking code because there's just so much that can go wrong um, when parsing so that's why they usually check it beforehand and also because it makes the checking process a lot faster and the rest of the code could just assume it's correct which it will be because it will all be grammatically correct anyway um, anyways so yes and once that checking is done in a normal compiler uh, it would go to the actual compiling process but mine just jumps immediately to the compiling process which is the most interesting step uh, so basically the first thing we do is we find global variables uh, we go this checks for arrays uh, checks if your arrays invalid checks if you're using a system variable um, then on, it'll go find it's done with global variables then we'll find the functions in the function space so right now there's only one function function main and um, it'll find it and you know finds the, the variables that it's declaring uh, complain if your formats wrong um, all sorts of stuff it'll yeah this finds variables finds the code finds the closing brace and uh, there's some code functions here as well by the way we have this uh, very convenient token set class which contains an array list of tokens uh, this basically is passed all over the place and it's very convenient I actually thought this was a really good design choice I was I wasn't sure if I was gonna do this but this was actually a really good idea because this has all sorts of um, functions that are useful in um, parsing so we've got like find we've got set tokens get tokens those are some standard ones we've got a two string which pretty much prints out the tokens as they would look uh, all sorts of stuff here but yeah this goes through the code and it compiles I'm not gonna go through it in detail because it takes very long 
but um, this compiles the code blocks so go between these two things it'll go find it got some more commented out code uh, this basically seems to call some functions yeah we go through we go through the compile code function which is over here it tries to find what kind of thing it is if it's a break statement or something if it's some math if it's a user function if it's I don't know these are all pretty much to categorize the code the specials are like if statements if not while until and we've got some conversion code and we've got um, launch flags and stuff so right now we're in the lexer by the way and um, let's see if I can find the code that does it here it is end type um, basically what this does is it parses it basically goes to the brackets in a loop for example and it says compile everything in here and that then calls a function and then that compiles each individual lines and it goes to the if statement compile everything in here which then calls another function which compiles that and then it leaves and stuff and uh, it keeps track of branch flags and stuff because basically what the compiler does I actually kind of forgot to mention this I'll probably put it in the video it's kind of important uh, this thing the entire purpose is to go through each line of code and convert it to assembly code which looks like this which is uh, what the comp well, computer instructions command org 32 computer instructions and there's this big table of all the functions we've got um, they're all very basic we've got like store um, to store a value and a certain variable uh, store an argument we got some math functions we've got branch if true branch if false uh, you know some basic instructions that we need to convert this to and uh, that's basically that this is a, little, a lot harder to read than this if you don't know programming they probably both look like a brush to you but trust me this is a lot easier to read and uh, yeah that's what this thing's doing so um pretty much when we go into if statements and into loops if you go into a loop and a loop uh, and you've got like a break it needs to know where to jump to and that would be the deepest loop it's currently in it's got this sort of loop stack thing I'm probably not making any sense but these are basically uh, as you can see creative variable naming at its finest flag name 3 flag name 2 uh, these pretty much put the branch flags here the exits to exit the loops as you can see here this one I think is no that's not it is it I'm not sure but basically it's the code to leave the loop well, it actually shouldn't leave it's continue so it should go to loop zero if not I don't know maybe it's wrong maybe my code's wrong I don't know but basically keeps track of that it's pretty cool that it does that in its parser and uh, now yeah, this keeps track of branching and uh, this this actually this one takes the code in an if statement and stuff so if you've got like a flag or if you're comparing two numbers this is responsible for that and it uses temporary variables and stuff if you're trying to use those and it'll warn you if you're using two equals tokens to try and compare because it'll get confused and um, yeah so this all this code we've got thousands of lines go we've got all the flags reference here we've got arguments we've got uh, math parsing stuff um this is probably I could talk for hours on how this all works this is the GPU stuff because we have actually have a lot of GPU commands but they're actually pretty easy to compile um we've got this method over here for all the different arguments we can take for the GPU commands. So we got defaults, only color, XY, XY color, XY, two sets of XYs, two sets of XY and color, and uh, invalid. We've also got invalid checking all over the place, as you can see. Because we don't have like any sort of uh, pre checker, which I seriously still regret. Anyways. Oh uh, yeah, this is the main parser stuff. For all the other functions, we've got input, print, lamp on, change x, change y, load, save. 
are low level math functions what not all those are checked in there and basically this all goes and it's for every instruction we add to this little variable called ASM code which builds up this little table of assembly code that we then um, as it goes through the code it will linearly lin linearly add code to it except for functions those are a little more complicated the main functions added at the very beginning and all the other functions are added at the end and um, some stuff but yeah basically that what this thing generates so now we've got the assembly code great but um we're still a long way to get before we can get it onto the computer